that Seth just sang is Psalm number 84, and a great psalm of um, just the heart of, of uh, David for the Lord. And a great, a great thanks for us. Hey, it's good to see you out tonight. Thanks for coming. For those of you who came over from Fort Lauderdale, I'm glad you're here. And then for those of you who are on the uh, island, I'm glad that you all are here as well. Let's, uh, let's take time to look at God's Word together. We're going to look at Psalm number 46. So if you have your Bible, I hope that you do, we'll look together at the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at Psalm number 46. And then in just a moment, we'll look at several verses in this psalm and kind of key in on a phrase in one verse. But psalm number 46. Just in case, uh, for those of you who we haven't yet met, my name is Tim Thompson, my wife Brittany, who was playing just a moment ago, and then Seth is our oldest son, he just sang. Samuel, Samuel, can you just wave right here? This is Samuel, that's the back of his head. And then uh, Asher's in Mama's lap, and and, uh, these are the three boys, and so uh, we get to travel around and preach in different churches. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be here tonight. All right, Psalm number 46. This is, this, if, if you were in service on Sunday morning, um, I mentioned that the passage we looked at, which was Matthew 22, was one of the top three passages that God had used in my life. This would have been Sunday morning in Fort Lauderdale. One of the other top three passages that God has used in my life is the psalm that we're about to look at. And specifically the verse, and it's a well-known verse, and it's well-known for a reason, and we're going to look at it tonight. But before we look at that verse, I would like to read through the entire psalm. And so um, we're going we're to look at the entire psalm. And here's, here's what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back and forth on the reading of it. So I'm going to read verse 1 of Psalm 46. And then I'd like to invite you, if you're able to, just to read verse 2. And then I'll read verse 3. You read verse 4. We'll go back and forth until we read the entire psalm. And we'll read the last verse all together. All right, so this is Psalm number 46. And uh, let's read. If you're, if you're physically able, would you mind just standing with me? We'll show our respect for the scriptures. And also refresh ourselves one last time before you're seated for a little bit. Psalm 46, I'll read verse 1, you'll be ready for verse 2. Here we go. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, Therefore will not we fear, fear, though though the the earth be removed, and and though though the mountains mountains be carried carried into the the midst of the sea. sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, the works of the Lord. What the desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease under the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still, no, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And together, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hey, thank you for standing. You may be seated. I'm going to take just a moment to talk to the Lord and ask Him to help us while we look at this passage, and then we'll look together at this song. Father, I love you, and I thank you very much for the truth that we get from your word, and certainly the help that comes from this this song. It has been a blessing to my heart and to my life, and God, I would love it if through this time that we have together, that what you have taught me through this would be transferred in even a greater way to those who are here and who are listening. I don't know what different people are going through, but you do. So, Lord, please answer questions and help and um, just, just do what only you can do. Dear God, we need you. We confess it. I ask that Satan would be, would be barred from being able to blind the heart and mind of any person that's here and that everybody would have an open mind and an open heart to what you have to say. We ask this because of Jesus Christ and in his name. Amen. Psalm number 46 is a great, I mean, all the way through, there are just several key verses that grab your attention when you're reading through it. Just just out of curiosity, or uh, basically for the sake of interest, I I specifically was helped by this psalm one time when I was reading through the entire Bible. Um, You know, I'd started in Genesis. This was a New Year's resolution. And I'd made the decision that I was going to start in Genesis and read all the way through. 
Um, usually, usually when I do that, I make it to about Leviticus chapter 19. And then um, that's about as far as I make it. But this time, I made it past Leviticus and past Numbers and uh, through Deuteronomy. And all of the scripture is very helpful. All of that is a blessing. The more you read, the more it makes sense and the more it's a blessing to you. That is certainly true. But there are certain passages that just jump out of the pages of Scripture and grab your attention. And Psalm number 46 is certainly one of those. When I, when I read through it, I loved it because Psalm number 46 immediately starts out as what I call just a psalm of strength. Or literally, uh, I, I think of it like a, a man's psalm uh, because it shows the might and power of God. The very first verse says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. This is speaking to the fact that God is never, uh, God is never outside of uh, cell service. You ever, you ever try to get in touch with somebody when they couldn't be reached because their phone was outside of cell service, or um, their phone was buried in the bottom of their purse, or it had been turned off, or they didn't plug it in, or whatever, whatever the cause or reason may, may be. You try to get a hold of them because it's something very important that you really need to get in touch with them about, and you can't because they're just, they're just not able to be reached. When the Bible says that God is a very present help in trouble, it's speaking to the fact that He is always available. That is, you, you can always reach out Amen. and get a hold of God, and He's never late. Now, admittedly, there have been times in my life when I felt like I needed, to God, I needed God to act right now, and He hadn't acted in the time that I thought He should. But God has never been late. Things are not outside of His control. And so Psalm 46, one is a blessing. You read through the rest of the psalm, and you may have noticed this when we were reading through it, but it talks about the fact how um, God is in charge of all the nations. That is, um, the Bible says, verse number six, that the heat and rage, the kingdoms were moved, the idea is that all the nations of the world gather together and they shake their fist at God and they defy God or they deny God or they want to stand against God and the generals come with all their armies and they shake their fist in God's face. And so God, rest of the verse, utters his voice and the earth melts. Again, it just shows again the strength and might and power of God. So I, I love this psalm because of what it demonstrates and teaches us about how great and how big God is. However, when I was reading through this psalm a number of years ago, verse number 10 grabbed my attention in a special way. And I was familiar with it. I mean, because it's a, it's a verse, and especially the first phrase, is oftentimes used for, for bookmarks, or you might see it on in a picture frame on a wall. Um, but it's a verse that is just power-packed. I, I want to share with you what God taught to me. So look down at verse number 10 in Psalm number 46. And let's, let's look at it together. And specifically, I want us to notice the first eight words of this verse. This is Psalm 46, verse number 10. The Bible says this. Be still and know that I am God. The rest of the verse says, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. But the first eight words of verse number 10 are, Be still and know that I am God. Now, I love this passage. I love these, this phrase for several reasons. One of, one of the great reasons why I love this phrase is because of how it covers every person. In other words, regardless of who you are and what your relationship is to God right now, regardless of what you're going through right now, whatever's happening on the inside of you, or whatever life has um, is beating you with, whatever's happening, this verse provides significant help in mindset and also in practically how you can live your life so that you can enjoy the power and presence of God. Now, real quickly, let, let, me, let me make a statement that is really the whole reason why we're looking at the passage tonight. And so please, please don't miss this. If, if you're going to pay attention to any part of the message, this is what you want to hear, okay? Psalm 46 and verse number 10 provides for us the key that unlocks the door to enjoying all of the peace and power and presence of God that you and I will ever need in our lives. Listen again. 
Psalm 46 verse 10 is the key that unlocks the door for us to be able to enjoy all of the peace, power, and presence of God that we'll ever need in our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud, but do answer it in your own heart and answer it in an honest way. Does God's peace, power, and presence describe or define the way that you live? In other words, are you currently living with God's peace, power, and presence being a real thing? Not, 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 um, ah, Brother Tim, that's what I want to be, or that's what I hope I am, but honestly, I mean, honestly, to the best of your knowledge, does God's peace, power, and presence, does that define where you are in your life? Okay, well, look, if not, this, this verse and this phrase is the key that unlocks all of that for you and for me. And if I will put this into practice, if you will put this into practice, then you can live with God's peace, power, and presence. And that is God's desire and design for you. Now, I mentioned that regardless of where you are in the relationship with the Lord, this verse is a help, and it really is. When the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, he could be speaking to anybody. He could be speaking to his enemy. I mean, con consider somebody who, who would call themselves an enemy of God. Someone who doesn't know God. Perhaps somebody that would like to know God or like to know how to get to God, but they don't know how to get to God. Um, if, you, if you just walk out on the street and talk to somebody about, about eternity, about whether or not they know they're going to heaven, if you, if you say to somebody, hey, um, are you going to heaven? When you die, are you, going to, are you going to spend forever with God? What, what most likely, and you can answer out loud, what most likely is the answer that they would give to you? If you ask, are you going to heaven, what will they say? I think so. I hope so. Okay. I think so. I hope so. All right. And then if you were to ask them, um, why, do you, why do you think you might get to go to heaven? If you say, I think so, or I hope so, or I'm like a 60%, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven. If you were to ask them, why do you think you're going to get to go to heaven? What most often would be the answer of someone who would like to get to God, would like to get to heaven, what would be their answer for how or why are they going to get there? I'm going to talk about their okay. religion or their behavior. Okay. Religion or behavior, the good things that they do. All right, that, and that usually is the answer, isn't it? And most people, and by the way, I don't, I don't know everybody's heart that's here, so I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but most people, by nature, naturally think the way that I'm going to get to God is by the things that I do, by the stuff that I do. And that, that's what most people think. I'm going to work my way or earn my way or, or get enough merit behind me or enough religiousness behind me so that eventually God will be willing to overlook my uh, indiscrepancies and faults and uh, if I'm being real biblical, the sins that I've done and then he'll let me into heaven and everything will be fine. Okay, so to a person like that, who doesn't know beyond doubt that they're on their way to heaven, this verse provides some real straightforward help. Man, and it's a great help. The Bible here says, Be still and know that I am God. And here's what he's saying. When God says this, when he says be still, the idea of the words be still are to, uh, to let slacken or to let loose. Um, almost, almost the idea of backing up. Um, if you were to take a rope, and decide that you were going to pull this piano out the back of the auditorium. So you wrap, you wrap a rope around the piano, and then you take that rope, and you put it up over your shoulder, and then you determine, I'm, I'm going to pull it back there, and you yank uh, with all your might. At the moment that you do that, that rope will straighten up and tighten up. And you can pull as hard as you want, or at least I could, and I'm not going to move the piano or not very well. And I pull, 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 pull as hard as I can. The idea of the words or the phrase, be still, is to back up so that the rope slackens. To, to, to let go of it so that the rope just falls limp to the ground. Be still, slacken. Be still, and then the second phrase is, and know, which is to think, consider. Hey, remember this. Think not, not just in your mind, but, but mull this over a little bit so that you recognize it. You recognize this truth in relation to your situation. And then God makes the statement that I am God. He's speaking this, not me. But when God makes the statement that I am God, 
He's calling your attention to what he's told you about himself and the rest of the psalm, which is he's a very present help in trouble. He's everywhere that the nations of the world could bring all of their generals and armies and stand against him. And with the word, he can melt them all. He's all powerful. There's nothing beyond his ability to do. He is setting himself up as he is the supreme ruler, that there's nobody like him. So he's saying in this verse, look, stop, let go of the rope of how you're thinking about things, back up, stop, and consider, God says, I'm God. In other words, I'm, God would say, I'm the one in charge. So that here's a person who thinks to themselves, I'm going to get to God by the things that I do. I'm going to work as hard as I can. Ugh. And if I'm religious enough, or if I'm good enough, or if I, uh, if, I, if I go to church enough or burn enough candles or go talk to a priest enough or am just a kind enough person, then eventually God will let me into his heaven. I can make it. And God says to a person like that, listen, you better back up and you better let the rope slacken about how you think about how to get to heaven and get to me, God says. And you better consider, know this, God says, I'm God, meaning I'm the one who determines how you can come to me. I'm the one who says what the way to me is. And God has stated in his word that the way to get to him is not by works of righteousness that we do, but only God has the ability to save us. And he has the ability to save us from our sins and make us his child or his children when we accept what he has provided as the way, which is Jesus Christ, which I'm sure most of you already know. So this verse is power-packed for even people that don't know God or that think the way to get to God is by things that they can do. It says, in essence, <clears throat> let go, forgive me, let go of anything you think about how you can get to God and consider, mm, he's God, it's his way that matters, and his way, according to the scriptures, is through Jesus Christ. So, to, to people who are lost, there comes this real important lesson. Okay, another group of people that this affects, people that are away from the Lord. Um, let me ask you a question that you don't have to admit to out loud, but I already know the answer. For those of you who are believers, you trust Christ as Savior, has there ever been a time when you've been away from the Lord? You don't have to answer, but I already know. And I know this about you because I know it about me. That there have been times when, whether outwardly I was, outwardly I was in gross sin, or if it was inward where I had just gotten to the place where I was, ah, I didn't care, or uh, I, I, my, my mind went in a direction it shouldn't go, or I was living angry or bitter, or whatever the case may be, and I was away from God, and I knew I was. Whenever I've been in a situation like that or in a mindset like that, most often I think to myself, at least at least for me, I thought, hey, but I'm, I'm okay. Everything, everything's fine because, um, well, I'm saved. And what I'm doing doesn't really affect anybody else anyway. And so it's fine. It's fine the way that I live. And uh, sometimes people say, well, God is a merciful God and he knows that our frame is dust. And he knows we're just human, so it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really matter the way we live. And oftentimes, people who are believers, but who are away from the Lord, whether inwardly or outwardly, in essence, say, I, I can live however I want to live. It doesn't really matter. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm a child of God, so it doesn't really matter. And they live life, in essence, thumbing their nose at God, saying, God, I don't, I don't really care what you say about this. I want to live this way, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And they think, it doesn't matter. It's, it's no big deal. Well, to a person like that who's away from the Lord, this verse says, hey, you better back up. You better let the rope slacken about how you're thinking about this whole thing. You better consider... I'm God, meaning I know what's going on. I, I, know, I know the bitterness. I know the anger. I know the, the, the uh, pushing away that you, that you have done towards me, God would say. And while it is true 
that God is a forgiving, loving, merciful God. Yes, He is. In His mercy, love, and forgiveness, God says, for my children, this is what God says, for my children, when you step away from me and you won't be called back, and there is a, there is a punishment that God brings for the per not because he doesn't love us, not because he doesn't like us, but because he does. Just, just like a parent with a child, if a parent loves, truly loves a child, then they will help correct that child so the child does <coughs> right so that that child's life can be, can be as good as it possibly can be. Because a child left to himself that has no parent to love him enough to correct him will most certainly end up destroyed. And so God, as a loving parent, beyond anything that we human parents could ever be, says, look, if you're thinking to yourself, it doesn't matter how I live, I can do what I want, nobody knows, or it doesn't really matter because I'm saved already, he says, you better let go, be still, let that rope slacken, and consider I'm, I'm God. I, I, will, I will chastise, I will punish, I will spank, and I will tell you, I will tell you both from the scriptures and from personal experience, that if I get to the place where I push against God and I reject God's call in my life to come back and fellowship with Him as His child, and it gets to the plane or the place rather where God has to do the chastisement, ah, oh, I would so much rather experience the forgiveness of God than the chastisement of God. And the same thing, I'm sure, friends, is going to be true for you. So again, I don't know anybody's heart or anybody's relationship with the Lord. But just consider, if right now in your life, um, you, you have not been listening or obeying the Lord in some area, you have rejected and turned away from the Lord, then, then let go of what it is that you think about this. Sam, you need to keep your attention right up here. Hold your hand and keep doing that. You need to let go of whatever you think whatever you think about uh, how God is going to operate with you and consider the fact that he's God, he knows you, he'll punish, but if you'll come back to him, he will forgive. And you know this already, but this is, I, I love this truth. The fact of the matter is, is that regardless, how far, regardless of how far I am away from the Lord, I am always only one step from being back in fellowship with him. Amen. And that is, that is true for all of us. Thank God for that. Yeah. Okay, so you have people who think, from this verse, here's the lessons we've learned thus far. To the people who think, i got to work in order to get to God. God says, let go of what you think about how to get to me and understand, I'm God. I've provided the way. The way is Jesus Christ. To the people who are oh, God's, God's children, but they're not living in accordance to the way of God and the light of God and what God says is right. To those people who think it doesn't matter because I'm saved so I can do whatever I want, God says, you better let go of that kind of thinking. And you better understand, I'm God, I'll punish. But I'll forgive. You come back to me and I will. And then thirdly, and really, the reason why we're looking at this passage tonight is this. Here's, here's what I love about this verse. Here's, here's what God used, used it, this verse to teach me. This verse teaches me that to those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, you want, you want God to have control of your life, this verse provides great Comfort. It provides that access into the peace and power and presence of God. For some in here, perhaps like you've never known, or for some, like you've known in the past, but you haven't known for a while. I'm telling you, this this is this is great. Here's the deal. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but um, after a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior all problems don't disappear. How many of you were aware of the fact that Christians sometimes have problems in life? Did you, did you know that? Okay. <laughs> I know that as well. Sure. Um, look, just because a person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, could, could a person who's saved and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and loves the Lord, could a person in that situation ever have relationships like with other people or with family members that aren't everything that they would want them to be? Could that ever happen with people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and say, yes, yes or no? Yes. Okay, sure, it could. Um, could a person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ and wants to follow Christ, could that person ever have financial situations that come up that could cause pressure 
and uh, could be could be uh, considered a problem. Could that ever happen financially? Yeah. Okay. Um, could a Christian who wants to follow the Lord Jesus Christ ever have a job situation or friendships or neighbor situation or even ministry situations that could cause stress in life? Yes or no? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely can. Okay, now please, now listen to me. And please, please hear what I'm about to tell you because this is so valuable. Psalm 46.10 is the answer to all of that. Not that it wipes away the financial issue or the relationship issues or the ministry issues or the work issues. That, that's not what it does. But what it does, Psalm 46.10, what it does is it opens up the door. When we take when we take what God has given us and put it into, into practice, then it opens up the door for in the midst of those situations to be able to enjoy God's peace, God's power, and God's presence. Let me tell you something. If you have in your life God's peace, God's power, and God's presence, you need nothing else. Amen. And that is not just talk to say in a sermon to make you feel good about it. That is the truth. If I have the peace of God on the inside of me, then storms around me in life can absolutely rage and roar, but it does not matter because I have peace on the inside. If I have God's power, what, what can come against me that God can't take care of? Or if I have God's presence, then what else could I ever want or desire? This, this has been such a blessing to me. I, I have in, I, in my life, um, both with family members and with friends and myself, been through situations and issues where I, honestly, I feel like I'm trying to drag a piano out the back of an auditorium, and I feel like there are weights on there are weights on me that just pressure me down, and I feel stressed about life, and my stomach is not about about relationship issues or about worries or concerns or finances and I'm biting my nails and I have all of this going on on the inside. And then when I understood what Psalm 46.10 was teaching, it came to light that while it is true that believers do still have all of those things pressing against them, that I don't have to live with stress and pressure attacking my insides. Where, where I can't handle life. And I don't know, again, I don't know anybody's situation, so please, pastor doesn't send anything to me. I, I, don't, I don't know. And it is true that people can be so under stress and pressure that they get to the place where that the only way they can seem to handle life is by getting medical help. That, that is, your, your, your chemicals may get out of balance, out of whack to the point where somebody, there needs to be help. I'm, I'm not saying that should never happen. What I am saying is that as a believer, you don't have to get there. You don't have to live there. And the answer is, listen, the answer is to be still and consider he's God. And when I say be still, I mean quite literally. To on a regular basis, on a daily basis, every day, every day, every day, and twice on Mondays. <laughs> to just take time. Stop and consider hmm. he's God. What, what is it? What is it that I can face that he can't handle? Somebody says, yeah, but, but the relationship, the relationship issues in my life are so huge. Oh, I'm just concerned. I'm worried about it. There's no way. 
I, I've got to be the one to fix. I've got to fix it. Somehow, I've got to come up with just the right thing to say that's going to fix this, fix this relationship issue. I've just got to come up with it. To that, God says, step back. Let the rope slacken. And consider the fact that God says, I'm God. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as rivers of water, he moveth it whithersoever he will. Meaning God is able to do in the heart and mind and life of another person something you and I never could. So either we can live going, I've got to fix it, I've got to do it, I've got to make it happen. Or else we can live going, uh, he's God. There's no amount of money that I could ever need that God can't take care of. Yeah. His coffers are full. And I get to enjoy His peace, power, and presence. Hey, and it's not, it, it's not a matter of um, one time I pray, God, please give me your peace, power, and presence, and that's the end of it. This, this key, this door opens up as I get into the habit of taking time to stop, to be still, Consider. Hmm. He's God. Now, real quickly, let me give you two illustrations and then our time is finished. One is a true true story, second one's made up. True story. Between my junior and senior year of college, my my now wife, Brittany, and I were engaged to be married. We got engaged our junior year. And I was going to go through that summer and then our senior year, and then we were getting married right after, right after graduation. So um, I had that summer between my junior and senior year, I had, I had marriage I was looking forward to. Um, I was getting ready to be a senior, which means I needed to have some kind of job to go to, and I didn't know exactly how that was all going to work out. I didn't know what I was going to do. That summer, I worked as a summer staff counselor at a Christian camp in Middle Tennessee at the, at the Bill Rice Ranch, for those of you who know it. And um, when, I, when I got to the ranch, I found out what my daily schedule was. My daily schedule started at 7.30 in the morning with giving devotions to about 150 guys. And then I would go help with meals, opening up doors so people would go into meals. As soon as that was finished, I would get my guys cleaning their cabin. And then I was supposed to go around and basically for the next two and a half hours, I unclogged toilets. And just I had a position called the runner position, go do that. After that, wash my hands, go to lunch, open up the door, let people go into lunch. After lunch, people got rest period. Unless you were involved in skits and music, then you went and practiced skits and music. So I could go practice skits and music. I got to be involved in both. After that, I would ref basketball from 2 until about 4.30, 5, sometimes 5.30, and then go to supper, open up the door for people to go into supper, then go get ready for service, go to service. Um, if I got to sing in the service or be in a skit, and then after that, I would either run the sound system or go down to Cowboy Town, which is where all the cool stuff happens after the service, and get ice cream ready for people to come and eat and clean the bathrooms and things like that. Then help at Cowboy Town. When Cowboy Town was finished, we'd do a cleanup, and then we'd go back to the cabin. We'd go to bed at about 11.15 at night, and then the next morning would start again at 7.30 in the morning. That was my schedule every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday was a little bit different, but not much. And that's how it was every day. Okay, so when I found out my schedule, I'm, I thought to myself, <laughs> I don't even know when I'm supposed to breathe. When does this, this take place? So I, I find this out. I'm thinking to myself, coming into the summer, I'm thinking, okay, I'm about to be married. What 22-year-old knows anything about being married? For that matter, what 35-year-old knows anything about being married? But what 22-year-old knows anything about being married? Um, I'm here at the ranch and I want to see God use my life. I have this, this humongously big, busy schedule and I've got next year's college to pay for. And this may surprise you, but working at the Bill Rice Ranch does not exactly pay for the next year of college. I think we got $30 a week and that didn't quite cover next year's tuition. So I have all of this, all of this stuff that's swirling around in my brain about these things that are going on. And uh, so, so God had begun to teach me this truth, though not from this passage. God had begun to teach me this truth. And so what I did every, every day was I set my alarm for about 20 minutes before when I needed to get up. And I'd go to a place that almost nobody else knows about on the ranch. And I, I would, I mean, I'd have my devotions. I would read through the passage wherever I was. And I had some specific requests I was making of the Lord. But then every day, I would just take time to just stop and consider, okay, 
your God. And life would say, you're about to be married. What are you going to do about that? You're the one who invented this thing. <laughs> Certainly you know. Your God. Be still and consider. You got, you got to have money to pay for next year. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. I can't take care of it. But you're God. Yeah, but, but what, what about, what about, what about, uh, what about helping the kids that are here at camp this week? You want them to know the Lord, don't you? So what about that? Okay, you're the one that moves in the hearts of people. You call people to yourself. You're the one that has to, you're the one that has to teach them. And for everything, everything that could cause, oh, 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 in my life, in taking time to be still and consider, that he's God, all of that turmoil turned to peace. Now, God was still God whether I recognized it or not. But in the moment of my recognizing it, it allowed the peace and power and presence of God to move in and fill my heart like I'd never experienced before. And honestly, that sum was significant. And just in knowing what it was to have, have God in control. Amen. Second illustration, and then we're done. <clears throat> Let's say, this is the made-up illustration. Let's say that um, I had a, a, a milk crate, you know what that is? Mm. A milk crate, and I had it full of rocks. And I take the milk crate full of rocks, and I set it right, right here on the platform. <clears throat> and then I tie a rope around the milk crate. And then I call uh, my youngest son, Asher. I call Asher to come up. He's, he's two years old. And I tie the other end of the rope around his waist. And then I tell Asher, I say, okay, Asher, I want you to pull this milk crate full of rocks to the back of the auditorium. Well, it's, it's heavy, and it's too heavy for a two-year-old to do. But he's down here, and he's pulling, pulling, pulling for all his worth. Pulling, pulling, but nothing's happening. But he's pulling, pulling, pulling. The rope is too tight, and he's pulling, trying to do what Dad told him to do. And unbeknownst to him, I come up behind him, and I pick up the crate of rocks. And he's pulling for all he's worth. And then every once in a while, when I'm ready to, I take a step. So Asher's down here. He's pulling, 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 pulling. All of a sudden, he moves it. He goes, all right, yes, yes, I got it moved. And then I take another step back there, and he takes another step, and he begins to move. Okay, let me ask you a question. Will the crate of rocks make it to the back of the auditorium, yes or no? Yes. Sure, okay. What, what will Asher's state be when he gets back there? And the rocks do too. What, what, in other words, what will his mindset be? Oh, dear, dear. <sighs> Man, Dad chose the right boy when he chose me. <laughs> Seth and Samuel are too pansy to do that, but I'm telling you. <sighs> if he makes it to the back of the auditorium, and he doesn't drop off on the side along the way, then he'll be pretty proud of himself for what he accomplished. Okay, same crate, same rope, same kid, same command, drag the rocks. I come up behind him, and I pick up the rocks. And while he's pulling, Asher turns around and he sees me. So he stops, and he comes back, and he grabs my pant leg. And every time I take a step, he takes a couple steps. And I take a step, and he takes a couple steps. Will the rocks make it back to the back of the auditorium, yes or no? Yes. Okay. What will Asher's state be? You ready? Peace. He's at rest. Power, not his own, but dad's. And dad's presence. What's the difference? The difference was letting the rope slacken and considering, ah, your dad, you can take care of this. All right. The, why, brothers and sisters in Christ, why, why would I ever want to get to the place where I live with anything less in my life than God's peace, God's power, and God's presence? 
Where you say, yeah, but my situation. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's slacken. Back up. And consider. Hmm. He's gone. In that, you find all the peace, all the power, and all the presence of God that you will ever need in your life. Sounds like a good way to live, don't you think? Be still and know that I am God. To those who don't know Jesus Christ, he says, let go of what you think, come my way. To those who are Christians but not walking with the Lord the way they ought to, there comes a warning. Hey, better stop, let go of the way you're thinking about it, and know I am God. And then to those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ, what comfort comes. All of God's peace, all of God's power, all of God's presence. So the admonition, the what you take home tonight is this. Hey, if right now in your life you're not currently taking time on a regular basis to just stop and consider that he's God, just consider him, then why don't you make a determination tonight that that's going to become a part of your life on a regular basis. And I'm telling you, the peace of God will rule in your hearts by Christ Jesus. And there's no better way to live. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this would become a reality in our lives. That we would experience that which you have, which you have stated clearly here. That, that we can know what it is to have rest in you. That we can be still and know that you're God. And in that, it is to give us that confidence that calmness, the ability to live not biting our nails and our stomach and knots and wringing our hands, but rather in the recognition that you are God. So Father, in our fast-paced society, help us to take time to be still. And I ask it, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now real quickly tonight, let me just ask simply this. I wonder who tonight would say, but a Tim, God has dealt in my heart about something specific. From the scriptures, God has challenged me that there's something that needs to start or there's something that needs to stop. There's a change that needs to happen. And you'd say by an upraised hand, Tim, please pray with me and for me that tonight will be a turning point in my life. And you'd say, please pray with me about it. Is there anybody like that tonight? May I pray with you about it? regarding this being still and knowing that he's God. Okay, good. God bless you. Then just right now, why don't you talk to him about it while I finish in prayer and close it in prayer, and then pastor will come and close the service as he sees fit. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts, and please, dear God, I pray that this is something that would be preached over and over again to our hearts and minds, that it would be life-altering and life-changing. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Pastor Price? Thank you. Thanks for the message. We need that, don't we? Continually. And uh, you know, we need a lot of times it's just to not forget the things uh, right. that uh, God's taught us and we've learned.